Welcome to the 2025 Paleo Rewind. If you haven't heard of it before, it's exactly what it sounds like. A bunch of us science nerds coming together to bring you all the latest news from this year's paleontology. If you haven't seen those videos yet, you can find them and their amazing creators in the description below. 2025 was a year full of incredible science and history, and that didn't taper off near the end. If you've watched the other videos in this series, there were a plethora of huge announcements over the year that could utterly change what we know about so many different prehistoric creatures, and December is no exception. In this video, you'll find huge news for creatures like Nanotyrannus, Mosasaurus, and even the mighty Anaconda, a snake we all know and love today. Let's dive right in and see what December had in store for us. Since dinosaurs are my main forte, I figured it would be an excellent choice to start with none other than a new study on Diplodocus, or what we assume is Diplodocus. In a paper by Dr. Tess Gallagher and her team, melanosomes from a sauropod scale were studied in depth for the first time. Melanosomes are organelles that are responsible for the storage and transport of melanin in animal cells, and they control the color of the animal. Typically, we find them most often in fossilized feathers, which has allowed us to determine somewhat accurate feather color for a plethora of dinosaurs. In a select few dinosaurs, their skin and scales were preserved well enough that we could do the same, analyzing their structure to determine the color of the animal. It's been done before on incredibly well-preserved animals like Borealopelta and Ornithischian, but outside of feathered dinosaurs and a few like that, no others have been determined until now. Fossils of what we believe are from Diplodocus were used in this study, and I say believe because the Morrison Formation is notorious for its variety of sauropods. As of right now, current analysis places it under Diplodocus, but future studies from this site could reveal them as a different animal altogether. Regardless of their identity, this study looked at the preserved skin of these creatures, revealing two distinct shapes of melanosomes, an oblong and a disc shape. That itself is rather significant because we haven't found multiple types of melanosomes in dinosaur scales before, only in feathers. The oblong shape, the easier and more common one to diagnose is almost what we expect to see. These melanosomes fall in line with almost the expected colors and would have produced black to reddish brown colors in life. But it's the other melanosomes that are more significant, as those closely resemble platelet melanosomes found in birds. These type of cells in birds allows them to produce iridescent feathers. Now that being said, Gallagher did stress that this does not mean that sauropods like Diplodocus were iridescent. What it does mean is that they were capable of far more complex colors than we would typically imagine. So they'd be a little bit flashier than we'd expect. To determine the color of the melanosome, we need to look at the size, shape, and structure. Melanosomes of the same size and shape might produce a different color based on the structure they were built in or the arrangement they're placed in within the animal and vice versa. If melanosomes are the same shape, their arrangement and inner structure might still cause them to be different colors or produce a different pattern. Such is the case here, with both types of melanosomes sitting very close together in the animal. This was interpreted as possible speckled pattern of sorts based on the arrangement, and while this does not allow us to determine the exact color of the animal without further studies, it gives us a much clearer picture and opens the door for future discoveries. But the possible sauropod colors wasn't the only unexpected find this month. Mosasaurs are one of the most popular extinct non non-dinosaur creatures today, in large part thanks to the Jurassic World movies and similar media. They were the terror of the open seas, hidden beneath the waves, but they were contained to the ocean and salt water right? As it turns out, wrong, actually. Back in 2022, a mosasaur tooth was discovered in North Dakota, hundreds of miles from the shores of the Western Interior Seaway. As part of this new study, it was determined that this tooth belonged to a large mosasaur named Prognathodon, though which species we aren't entirely sure. The tooth definitely seems to belong to a larger animal, which matches the largest three species in the group, all of which could reach upwards of 30 feet, or 9 meters in length, as well as the type species, which could reach around 20 feet, or 6 meters in length. Curiously, it was found amongst a plethora of other fossils at the site, including a multitude of terrestrial creatures like Tyrannosaurus and Edmontosaurus, along with a plethora of freshwater creatures, but not a single marine animal in sight. Now you might say, but Dinofax, couldn't it have been carried there or somehow ended up there through other means? Yeah, I suppose in theory it could, but that's where the rest of the study comes into play if you want to be patient. Despite being found so far away from the sea, there's a multitude of factors that the authors, led by Melanie During, had to consider. They analyzed the carbon, oxygen, and other isotopes found within the tooth, as well as other mosasaurine teeth that have been found in similar situation, miles away from the sea or oceans. The teeth found away from the seas were found to have a much larger carbon isotope value than any other mosasaur tooth known, which is more in line with a freshwater environment. The reason for this disparity is twofold. What they ate would raise the value of their carbon isotopes, but for most mosasaurs, this would be offset by them diving into the deep waters out at sea, which lowers it. 
These prognathodon teeth shows the raised value of the prey they were eating, but does not decrease as would be expected from diving, retaining a higher concentration. Another factor they considered was the fact that other smaller mosasaurs have been found in freshwater environments already, which definitely lends support to this theory that the giants like prognathodon could have done the same. Their analysis also suggests that the western interior seaway was becoming desalinated during the end of the Cretaceous, and many new brackish environments were formed with what's known as a halocline. For reference, Halaclines are where the dense salt water sits below a layer of lighter, fresh water. As a result, it's theorized by During and the team that mosasaurs began to adapt to freshwater environments near the end of the Cretaceous, similar to bull sharks of the modern day, swimming upstream in fresh water. These freshwater mosasaurs would have been a top aquatic predator in these environments, outsizing the local crocodilians and likely even hunting dinosaurs and similar. Further studies will need to be done to determine exactly what these mosasaurs were doing there, but as of right now, it seems at least that some of these giant marine lizards were far better adapted to life in freshwater than we could have ever imagined and may have dominated the rivers. And when it comes to aquatic reptiles, few living are more famous today than the largest living snake, the green anaconda. Anacondas are pound for pound the heaviest snakes alive today, making them the largest despite others like the reticulated python being slightly longer. But anacondas are no slouch in that department either. Reported sightings of snakes upwards of 20 feet have occurred all throughout our history with them, but many of them have been anecdotal at best or publicity stunts at worst. Outside of a published study that revealed a potential new anaconda species, a few specimens held in captivity, and a few measured in the field, few true giants have ever been found. While anacondas upwards of 25 feet could potentially be possible, it has long been theorized that like crocodilians, human hunting of the animal would decrease their size over time, leading to an assumed bias with the lack of large specimens. However, this study and its recent fossils find that, that isn't the case. The origins of anacondas have been murky at best before now, with other fossils found that tentatively dated them near the end of the Miocene or later. These new fossils place them at over 12 million years old and much farther back in the Miocene, and they reveal that these snakes have been giants the whole time, but not particularly larger than the ones we have today. Back then, they were far more widespread across the entirety of northern South America, but they attained their giant sizes even then, with this new fossil being around 16 feet or 5 meters plus. At the time they first evolved, global temperatures were far warmer. Typically, this results in giants arising, as they did here. These ancient anacondas would have coexisted with some true giants, like the Cayman Purosaurus, one of the two largest crocodilians ever known as of today. The researchers, led by Andres Alfonso Rojas, expected to find giant anacondas like the stories would have you believe today, but what they found instead were the origins of this gigantism. The warmer temperatures at the time likely resulted in the rise of anacondas' giant body size in the first place, similar to their cousin Titanoboa millions of years prior. This means that anacondas have had the same body size since they first arose, though larger specimens may have been more common back then. Despite the massive changes to their environment over the last 12 million years, there has remained enough large prey to keep these giants going. Between the huge fish dwelling beneath the waters of South America's jungles and large mammals like capybara that line the banks of the rivers, anacondas have managed to maintain their body size this entire time. That itself is incredibly fascinating and shows us the same mentality as crocodilian evolution. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. While we're on the topic of giant animals, we've got to talk about the new study on Edmontosaurus. If you're a fan of paleontology, you might have heard the term Edmontosaurus mummy before, most famously from specimens found in the early 1900s by none other than Charles Sternberg. Dinosaur mummies like Sternberg's typically preserve areas we haven't seen before in fossils and usually soft tissue. In this case, it was dinosaur skin. Paleontologist Paul Sereno realized that Sternberg's find wasn't a one-off situation. The locale where they were found has also yielded other dinosaurs with preserved skin and more, including two Edmontosaurus found in the early 2000s by Sereno's team. They dubbed a 10-kilometer area in and around Wyoming as a mummy zone, as it had the perfect conditions for yielding such fossils. These conditions did something unique to those Edmontosaurus. They fossilized through a method dubbed clay templating. These Edmontosaurus likely died through drought, during a dry season of sorts. After their death, normal decay would have begun to took place, hollowing out the flesh and muscle inside the animal's corpse. Like all decay, this would have produced bacteria, and in some cases, this bacteria turns into a sort of biofilm that covers the animal's skin, as they described in this study. After the dry season, when the waters returned, the Edmontosaurus were likely buried by a flash flood, and when they were, these hollow portions of their body became filled with sediment. As the dinosaurs became buried, the biofilm on the outside of their body would have attracted clay from the surrounding sediment, 
forming a mask of material less than a millimeter thick on the animal's skin. From there, the dinosaur became mummified, with the sediment inside also allowing it to fossilize. This thin clay mask preserved incredible details of Edmontosaurus that have never been fully seen before. While we've known for a long time that they had a head crest, its full extent was never revealed. We now know that the crest of Edmontosaurus is not exclusive to its head. While that certainly has the most brazen and out there look compared to the rest of the crest, it also ran from the head down to the midline of its body, similar to dinosaurs like Oranosaurus, though not nearly as extreme. After passing the hips, this crest forms into a sort of spike row that extends over the majority of the tail. The skin itself of the animal was rather thin compared to what we expected, with wrinkled bunches like some animals have in life. Sorrento seems confident this was not due to decay, but that the creatures itself had thin skin. But arguably, one of the most important parts of this find are hooves. Now, that doesn't sound like a huge deal, but outside of mammals, hooves have never been confirmed for any other animal. Yet here, we find them on the hind legs of Edmontosaurus, a bipedal animal at that. Just like mammals, their hooves were covered in keratin. Instead of taking over the entire foot, their hooves covered a majority of each of their toes. Previously, when assuming hadrosaur foot covering, we assumed they were short, tightly packed hooves, if any at all, just barely covering the digit. Now we know the hoof extends quite a ways beyond the toe, though still not to the degree of modern hoofed mammals like horses. The discovery of such an ancient hoofed animal, let alone a hoofed reptile, is one of the most stark cases of convergent evolution I think I've ever seen. Mammals evolved their hooves from more moderately sized ancestors before those groups adapted to having larger forms. On top of that, mammals with hooves are all quadrupedal and have similar limb morphologies for both their forelimbs and hind limbs. Meanwhile, Edmontosaurus is an enormous animal to have hooves at all. All, along with being bipedal. The team currently believes that the hooves originated in early large hadrosaurids and may have existed as early back as the Jurassic. This whole find is one of the most significant of the year, giving us an incredibly detailed look into the physical appearance of a dinosaur beyond just their fossilized bones, something only a few like Cetacosaurus have ever been able to claim before now. And there was another dinosaur update that I know many folks were incredibly excited to learn. Nanotyrannus, the miniature tyrant lizard itself, is back. Doctors Lindsay Zano and James Napoli have provided incredibly strong evidence separating them from Tyrannosaurus rex, and what's more, creating its own unique genus with two distinct species. However, that study was technically published at the end of October, which means you can find more details about it in the October video for this year's Paleo Rewind by the amazing folks at Geosplore. But we'll still cover all the bases here to understand the new study that happened in December. To understand this, you need a little bit of background. The skull that would first give rise to the name Nanotyrannus was found in the 1940s by paleontologist Charles Gilmore and was thought to belong to Gorgosaurus at the time. Ever since it was first proposed as an individual separate from Tyrannosaurus rex in the 80s by Robert Backer, there has been a lot of contention around this tiny tyrant. Without getting into the nitty gritty, the main argument has been whether Nanotyrannus represents its own unique taxon or was simply just a juvenile form of T. rex. There's been a lot of evidence and claims from both sides. Prior to the October study, the main evidence for Nanotyrannus being its own unique genus was claimed based on morphological traits in their skull and arms. Backer believed that the original skull was fused, which is a sign of adulthood when an animal finishes growing, but he was rebuked by Thomas Carr, who claimed it was actually an immature animal. Another point from the Nanotyrannus side was the difference in tooth count. Most skulls attributed to Nanotyrannus had 15 to 16 teeth on either side of the upper jaw and 16 to 18 teeth on either side of the lower, as opposed to Rex with 11 to 12 on top and 12 to 13 on bottom. The real problem was that there wasn't enough evidence. Those who argued against Nanotyrannus made a valid point as well. Many of the things used to distinguish Nanotyrannus from a Rex were traits that could be explained by different stages of growth or individual variation. When it came to tooth count, it was shown that other Tyrannosaurids, like Gorgosaurus, had a reduction in teeth as they aged. What was interpreted as fusion in the skull could be argued as compression of the fossil. The biggest issue and major component against Nanotyrannus for years was the fact that most fossils showed signs of immaturity and weren't definitive adults. The lack of an actual adult Nanotyrannus was its own biggest downfall. When a new study was published in 2024 to try and reassert Nanotyrannus, a huge uproar spread across the scientific community, but one voice made the most sense. Thomas Holtz, one of the world's leading experts on Tyrannosaurs, voiced his opinion that neither side could be conclusive until new discoveries were made. The issue was the same. There was not enough evidence to entirely support one side or the other. 
both had valid arguments, and up to that point, the evidence seemed to be against Nanotyrannus. Holt said, to be conclusive, we would need to find either a young Tyrannosaurus that is definitively a Rex, or a fully mature Nanotyrannus that was relatively complete and definitively not a Rex. Well, we found one. The dueling dinosaurs, a pair of fossils that were obtained by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, was evaluated by Zano and Napoli in an incredibly extensive paper. The paper shows almost definitive proof that Nanotyrannus is a valid genus and furthermore that it had two unique species. But like I said, if you want more details on that, make sure you check out Geosplore's October video. And now, we found another. The new research from December focuses on the original Nanotyrannus holotype, the skull that was originally thought to belong to Gorgosaurus before the debate began in the 80s. Specifically, it takes a look at the serratobranchial bone, more commonly known as the hyoid bone. In many modern animals, like ostriches, the researchers discovered that the tiny hyoid changed with maturity and could be used on a smaller scale to determine age similar to larger fossils that show growth rings. With that in mind, as well as the new insight from Napoli and Zano, paleontologist Christopher Griffin took a look at the hyoid bone and was able to show that it revealed that the original holotype is in fact a fully mature Nanotyrannus lancensis. While not as impactful as the October paper, the fact that another confirmed Nanotyrannus exists lends more support to the creature's return. Also, the fact of it being the holotype is significant in reinforcing the resurrection of this creature's name, as otherwise they might have been forced to change the name of the animal. Naming rules are really weird with science, not my fault. This new Nanotyrannus discovery reinforces this amazing creature, and could potentially lead to future discoveries of animal maturity using the hyoid bone as an aging method. That itself is nothing short of absolutely brilliant. As are all of you folks, thank you all so very much for tuning into this year's Paleo Rewind and making it to the end with me. Just because it was the end of the year doesn't mean December wasn't full of amazing discoveries and advancements for science. There were so much that that Edge and I were able to double up in December this year, so make sure you check out his video and the others in this year's Paleo Rewind to make sure you keep yourself caught up with everything about paleontology. There were some incredible folks participating this year, and you won't want to miss even a moment. Thank you all so very much for watching this video, mates. It means a lot to me, and you're all wonderful and brilliant people. I hope you had an excellent year, and get ready for another one full of new science and discoveries. Until then, as always, folks, remember to be good people, drink plenty of water, water and have a fantastic day.